this Sunday morning. Uh, today in our study of the book of Isaiah, we move into a major transition uh, in his prophecy, in the, in the book. There's an insert in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along today. Just take that out at this point. And uh, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, if you need to borrow a Bible, just let our ushers know. If you need an insert, let them know, and they'd be happy to help you. <clears throat> Do you ever feel like you're in a rut? Some days, I feel like I'm in a rut. Every time I go to bed at night, I find I have to just get up in the morning. I'll wait for you to respond. Got all day. Okay. Maybe I got off to a bad start. Okay. Well, if you felt like you've been in a rut in our study of Isaiah, good news, we're t turning the corner today. Uh, Isaiah's been teaching us lessons from King Hezekiah's life in Isaiah 36 to 39, but now we're in chapter 40. An abrupt change in Isaiah's whole message. Listen. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, and she's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Up to this point in Isaiah's prophecy, from chapter 1 to 35, the nation hadn't been doing that well. They've been engaging in idolatry and all kinds of sins, and God had to bring discipline into the, uh, into the country with foreign nations invading, and so on, to try to turn their hearts back to him. Uh, but now, something's changed. Uh, something's different. Isaiah's message is now all about comfort and consolation, not judgment and uh, wrath. Uh, I, got, I have a feeling that it's be, perhaps because of King Hezekiah's commitment to follow the Lord. He literally turned the nation back to worshiping the Lord first in their lives. And I think as a result of that, the whole tone of Isaiah's message changes. Um, God has a different message to those people who are now walking and following him and trusting his promises. So Isaiah chapter 40 begins with, it opens with a cry, and it's a command to comfort God's people. From this point on in Isaiah, what I think is fascinating to me from this point on in Isaiah's prophecy, comfort will be a repeated theme the rest of the way, chapter 40 to 66. Uh, the word comfort is only mentioned two times in Isaiah chapter 1 to 39, but it's mentioned 15 times from 40 to 66. Um, in fact, Isaiah's prophecy ends with what I call the comfort trifecta. Uh, if you look at Isaiah 66, 12 and 13. It's kind of this is the, coming to the end of Isaiah's whole prophecy. This is where this theme has been carried through these chapters, and here's where it kind of ends. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her, meaning his people, peace to her like a river. And the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, you will be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees as one whom his mother comforts. So I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Comfort, comfort, comfort. What is comfort? And why does God think we need it? Well, the word comfort in Hebrew is the word naham. Naham. It means basically to be at peace in the midst of a storm. It's kind of an ironic concept, uh, a conundrum, if you will, or paradox. Uh, it means that, Nacham means even though all is not well, we're given the assurance that all will be made well. That's Nacham. Comfort. Comfort my people. Example, I can remember when my kids were young, very young, 
And, uh, you know, a storm would come up and loud thunder, crashes of lightning filling the sky, and uh, the kids were afraid. And they'd come to one of us, Linda or I, and uh, we'd hug them. And you know what we'd tell them? It's going to be okay. You can stay with me. It's going to be okay. Just hang on. It's not going to stay. That's, we comforted them. Why? Because <laughs> in the middle of the storm, there can be peace if you know where it's found. Uh, so God is commanding com that his people be comforted. Why? Because not only Israel, but we live, we continue to live in a scary world, broken by sin. Scary and crazy, <laughs> sometimes we look at it. Uh, and God's people, Israel, if you recall, have been through a lot of adversity. Um, they're going to go through still more before it's all over. And we as Christ followers, while we're in this world, as God's people, we'll experience adversity as well. This, to me, is, is an oasis in the scripture. Um, here in Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 1, what God desires for his people is that they know his comfort. No matter what we face. It's interesting to me that if you, if you heard this, in verse 1, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. It's interesting to me that the command comfort is repeated. He doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. God never repeats our need for discipline and judgment the same way. He never says, judge, oh, judge my people. But he does say comfort. And I believe the repetition is, is revealing to us something about the heart of God for his people. This should not surprise us, especially those of us on the, the other side in the New Testament. We're told there, God is identified as the God of all comfort. As we read this morning, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Comfort, comfort, I mean... Repeated over and over again in that verse. Paul couldn't get over it. Notice it says, who comforts us in all our affliction. It's the word naham. Um, things may not be going well, but all will be made well. And so we're going to see as we go on in Isaiah the, this repeated theme coupled with this interesting uh, exhortation, don't fear, don't be afraid. Um, God is commanding our comfort because as Jesus told us, in this world we're going to have tribulation, we're going to have losses, we're going to have trouble. And when we do, we're going to need it. We're going to need the ham. We're going to need to know it's going to be okay. Just like a parent would their child when they're scared to death. <laughs> In times of uncertainty, we're going to need to lean on something certain. In times of instability, we're going to lean, need to lean on something stable. <laughs> and in times of loss, we're going to need to lean on something that will never pass away. 
times of trouble, we're going to want answers to our fears. We're going to want help. We're going to ask questions. Where's God? What will happen to us? Will things get any better? Is there any hope? Comfort is what provides the hope when things get difficult. That's what I want to begin to launch today, uh, how God offers his comfort. God knows we're going to need it, and he wants us to experience his comfort, his peace, shalom, no matter what we face. He's making it available. In fact, he insists in verse 1, let this be your state. I'm commanding it. How does God comfort us? Well, very basically, I believe as we unfold this forward, he comforts us by knowing, by helping us know that he is the basis of our comfort. In in fact, that uh, description, he is our parent. He is our father. (laughs) When we're in the storm, we need to know from him things are going to be okay. Here, this, as I did this, as I've study, been studying this, this, this uh, very uh, penetrating, convicting uh, thought kind of God led me to here, uh, challenging me personally especially, the, the biblical perspective of how we should look at our life at any moment is always positive, never negative. Think about it. God, in the scriptures, gives us reasons to be optimistic, not pessimistic. That's hope. And the only way we can have it is to know there's something out there that's solid. We can count on it. We can trust it. When when we hear it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Because of who's speaking to us. Now, this may not be a challenge for some of you. you But for uh, us, for me, the, uh, the, half, the glass half empty kind of person, it's a challenge to uh, think this way and trust that uh, what God is saying is, is true. Uh, as I look at the fruit of the Spirit, you see, the Spirit's fruit, it, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. seems to me that's all positive. What kind of fruit is coming out of me? Well, notice one of them is shalom, peace. <clears throat> It's fascinating to me, and it's convicting to me. Our comfort, our peace, our shalom rests squarely, in my opinion, on two biblical truths uh, we find in Scripture about God. First, He is sovereign over all. Second, God has a good purpose that He will fulfill. Why? Because He's good, (laughs) He does what's right every time. And no one can thwart his will, his good purpose, ever. He's sovereign. So the basis of our comfort as God uh, repeats it for us, this is his heart's desire for each one of his children. You could say it another way, oh, that my people might experience my comfort. Oh, that they've experienced my comfort. I know it's stormy out there. Come on and be with me. Because it's going to be okay. He is the God of all comfort because he can... 
be in that position because, you know, the future is in his hands. You realize that? The, we'll, we'll see that as Isaiah continues here. Um, the future is in his hands. And his hands always work for good, not for evil in our life. And that is what gives us hope and how we know it's going to be okay no matter what we face on multiple levels. So comfort rests, if I could say it this way, in our experience of it that God desires for us in verse 1. By the way, this is just the introduction to this. It's kind of a mini-series on God's comforts. <laughs> it's just an introduction. But our comfort rests on our faith in who God is and what he has said. Just like a parent would say to their scared child, it's going to be okay, and they trust them. Who God is and what he has said. Notice what comes right after. Did you notice this in your Bible? Are you looking at it? Do you realize what follows verse 1? Verse 2. Did you see that? God command, God's commanding our comfort. Oh, I wish you could experience my comfort. Uh, that's my heart's desire. And right after that, what do we see? God's words of comfort. He says, uh, speak. Speak kindly to <laughs> Jerusalem. Okay. So right away we get a hint at uh, how we might tap into God's comforts. Listen to the words he's going to give us. What are God's words of comfort? I could tell you, sum it up in this, God's promises uh, are designed to, to give us comfort. And so what was interesting is I did this study. I started counting God's promises uh, in Isaiah, beginning in Isaiah 40 through the end of the book. I started counting them. His promises to his people. I gave up after I reached 50. I gave up. I said, there's too many. I got to chapter 46 and 20 more chapters to go. Promises. Speak. I want my people to know my comfort. Speak to them these words. And what, he, what Isaiah begins to do is unfold as we go through. If you want to know, uh, you want God's comfort, hope, and shalom, look to his promises. I think they, they kind of become for us the good shepherd's rod and staff. As we go through valleys, shadow of death, that's what his promises are for. Because we are comforted because the creator, our God, is with us. We need to know that. So our comfort is based on who he, God is and what he has said. Uh, here's some, a couple of examples of God's words of comfort uh, as we move forward in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44 uh, I mean, I, literally, I lost track. I, 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 there's too many. Isaiah 44, 24, 26. Uh, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, Causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of the diviners, uh, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness, confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built and I will raise her ruins again. And he just starts giving them promise after promise. 
Isaiah 46, 8 to 10. Remember this. Listen. So remember this and be assured. You can count on this. <laughs> Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God, there's no other. I am God, there's no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things that have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. The future is in his hands. He calls it. Our comfort is in the God who made all things, controls all things, and accomplishes his good purpose in all things. Now, as we go forward from this point on in Isaiah, <clears throat> uh, I've outlined, as we go from 40 to 66, I've outlined more than, I don't even think I can get to all, more than nine comforts. Huge, huge things. God's sending our way to bring us comfort when we're scared. More than nine. I don't, I don't even think I can get through all of them. But they're there. Uh, and when I... We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Comfort is, is, is knowing that all will be made well even when things aren't well. And God is the God of all comfort because he's the source and, and giver of it. He's all good. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's sovereign over all. He loves us with an everlasting love and he gave everything for us so that our future with him would be filled with joy and good. So if I can encourage you this week, start your reading, I grab a few promises to hang on to in times of uncertainty or instability. Uh, to give you hope and a positive mindset when you face something difficult. God's comfort and shalom, you see. What I, I just can't get over uh, the tremendous privilege you and I are in uh, on the other side of uh, the crucifixion and resurrection. People in Isaiah are looking forward to this. They're trusting that it will happen because God said it would. But we, looking back, see that he did it. <laughs> Everything Isaiah said about the Messiah, which we're going to look at, you'll be amazed. I mean, uh, as he starts talking about it, the Messiah in Isaiah 42, It's, uh, it's amazing. But anyway, we're looking back, and we realize that God's, he's talking, did you, did you hear this verse? Two? Speak kindly to Jerusalem, call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity's been removed, that she's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now at this time in Israel, they don't know how that, what are you talking about? Am I gonna have to offer two goats? Uh, double? How is that? They didn't know. They didn't have the information yet. But it's obviously preparing us for Messiah. We're going to have peace that we haven't even thought of yet. The warfare is going to be ended. And he's promising it. I gotta now we're going to talk about this a little further detail next, next time. But today, just to note, God's comfort and shalom, his peace, was purchased for us. We know. We know things they didn't. It was purchased for us at great price. The price of his son, Jesus, who he'll, Isaiah's going to start talking about him more and more. Who he's, what he's like, <laughs> what to expect. It's refreshing. He's unlike anything, any other person we've ever seen. And he brings God's shalom. He makes peace on our behalf. 
And everyone who believes in Jesus receives the gift of eternal life, living waters. God gives us right in our heart of hearts the Holy Spirit. In him we experience God's shalom. As Jesus said in John 6, 63, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace, shalom. You could also slash comfort, knowing that all things will be made well, even though they're not right now. So in me, you may have peace. In the world, you've got tribulation. But take courage. Again, this is, you need to look at this positively. Take courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. He holds the future in his hand. He makes our peace possible because of who he is, what he said, and what he did. So I invite you, if you have never believed in Jesus and received the free gift of eternal life, we have elders and deaconesses down front afterward. We'd love to pray with you. Not sure you've ever done that. We'd love to pray with you. Come on down front. Uh, or you could just pray a prayer and, and to God and, and tell him, I believe Jesus is the Messiah who came to die for my sin, and I welcome him into my life. You have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you today <laughs> that you've identified yourself as the God of all comfort. Not only that, we see in Isaiah 40, verse 1, your heart of hearts is that we all might experience your comfort, doubly so, uh, knowing who you are and what you've said and what you have done for us. As a parent loves their child, so you've told us you love us just like a father loves his son as a mother, her child. Would you give us... Uh, and allow us to experience that comfort today, this week, knowing that all will be made well, even though things right now may not be well. We ask you to give us the courage and strength to trust your promises. I pray that even this week, those of us here, as we read your word, you might uh, just give us a promise we can hang on to for a while. Uh, and that we could just enjoy your presence with us in that promise. We ask for the grace to do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.